Essentialism is basically the thought that there are some things about you, there are some properties that you have that make you who you are. And if you didn't have those properties, you wouldn't be you anymore. Make a list of different traits that you have. Uh, maybe your hair color's on there, your age, uh, maybe your favorite kind of popsicle is on there. Maybe your personality traits are on there, your gender, your race, the languages that you speak. Uh, maybe your DNA, DNA sequence is on there. Now, write all those things down on a piece of paper and start erasing them one by one. And as you erase, erase each thing, ask yourself, would I still be the, the thing that I am <laughs> if we got rid of this trait? Now, you might think that if you changed your hair color um, or if you no longer uh, preferred raspberry popsicles over orange popsicles, that you'd still be the same person. Now, if that's the case, then your hair color and your preference for raspberry popsicles are what we would call accidental properties. Uh, many of you might think, and uh, many people do think, that uh, gender is something that you couldn't change. If you changed it, you wouldn't be the same person anymore. Or likewise, many people think that if you changed your DNA sequence, you would not be the same person anymore. If you made those judgments, then you would think that uh, a person who made those judgments would think that gender and one's DNA sequence are essential properties. We can define essential properties a bit more rigorously now. A property, a property is essential for an object if the object must have the property to exist and to be the kind of thing that it is. So for example, we were talking last week about the body theory and the soul theory. According to the body theory, uh, having a human body is essential to being a person. Um, having pers per personal identity, according to the, the uh, soul theory, is, uh, or excuse me, having the same body is what makes you the same person. You can't lose your, if you got rid of your body, you wouldn't be a person anymore. So uh, having a body, according to that theory, is an essential property of being uh, a person or of having personal identity. On the flip side, um, we talked all the, the, the soul theory takes the opposite stance. They think, look, you could wake up in a different body and you'd still be the same person. So they're saying that's not an essential property. The body, having uh, a body is not what makes you, having a human body is not what makes you a person. So according to that theory, having a body would be what we call an accidental property. Property is accidental if an object has it, but it doesn't need it to exist. Or to, be, or to be the kind of thing that it is. Uh, those are long-winded ways of putting a, a, a kind of, or not, I shouldn't say long-winded, they're, <laughs> they're a bit longer, but those are technical ways of putting the idea that an essential property is a property that you must have. Without it, you would cease to exist um, as a certain kind of thing. Accidental properties are, they're, they're ones you've got, but you could lack them. It's possible that you could exist, you could imagine yourself. It's possible that you could exist uh, without that property, uh, and you could keep on going without it. Now, essentialism is the theory that there are at least some things that have essential properties. That means that there are some things that are defined by the properties that they have. Having certain properties make those things what they are, and the things would cease to exist uh, if they didn't have those properties anymore. Typically, essentialism pertains to a domain of objects. So um, you might be an essentialist about animals. That is, uh, for each species of animal, there are certain. You're saying uh, that there are certain properties that are essential properties. There are properties that each animal must have to make it the animal that it is. Um, later in the class, we'll talk about gender essentialism. Essentialism claims about about gender. So the the point here is that um, essentialism. Typically, you're an essentialist about some specific domain of of entities or of things. Our definition of accidental and uh, essential properties quickly 
points us off in two directions. There's actually, we, we had built into our, our definition kind of two different sets of concerns and we, sh we need to distinguish those two concerns because we can ask, we can be concerned about essences or we can look for essences when we're worried about two very different types of questions. Now the first question is, does a collection of individuals constitute a kind that is defined by a common or unique property? Now, in this case, the common or unique property would be the essence, and you've got to have that property in order to belong to a, um, to a class of things. So take uh, a, a collection of individuals, a bunch of dogs. When we're asking this question, we're wondering then, well, which property do all the dogs have that makes them belong to the class or belong under the concept dog? Now, on the other hand, we might take a bunch of dogs, a bunch of cats, and throw them all together in a collection. And then we might say, well, what, what makes them belong together in, in a collection? In this case, it wouldn't be what makes them dogs, but probably what makes them all mammals or what makes them all uh, more animals in general. Now, we could take a bunch of random stuff and throw that together, and we could get a null answer, right? We might, we might be, well, nothing makes this collection of individuals a kind. Now, the, the, the key concept here is, is that of a kind. It means uh, that a kind is, a, you can think of it as a type. Um, it refers to our concept words like dog, cat. Um, and it wants, it, our, so a kind is a, a, a universal. It's a, it's a grouping that, um, that cuts things at its joints, as we'll, as we'll see in a moment. Now, a second question you can ask is not what makes an individual thing a member of a class, but what makes this individual the very individual that it is? So, for example, uh, take a shoe. When we're considering the first question about essences, we could ask, what properties does this thing, this shoe, have to have to be a shoe? What properties um, does it have that make it a member of, it, of, of the class shoe, of, of shoes? On the other hand, we can ask, what distinguishes this shoe from every other shoe? What makes it a distinct, unique individual? And presumably our answer to that would be something like, well, it's made out of different matter than other shoes are made of, and it exists at, its, at a, a distinct point in space. We'll talk about both of these in more detail. We're going to call the first sort of question, we'll, we'll group concern with the first question under the heading of, of uh, type essentialism. Type essentialism is concerned with the properties that objects must have to be members of classes. So you can think of the things it needs, the conditions for membership are what this one is worried about. An individual membership, uh, excuse me, we'll call the a concern with the second question, uh, individual essentialism. Individual essentialism is wondering what makes each individual distinct from other individuals that are of the same kind or that are of different kinds. Okay, before we take a look at type essentialism in a bit more detail, we need to back up a little further and look at some of the historical antecedents, some, uh, some of the historical discussion of essences that people had in mind when they started thinking about and developing type essentialism in the, in the 20th century. Um, now, Locke had, he distinguished two types of essences. He called them nominal essences and real essences. The word nominal, uh, its root is nom, which means name. So nominal essences, he's saying they're the essences uh, that attach to the names that we use. And what he's thinking of is the ideas that we associate with a word. So think of the word gold. Um, you might, you're probably thinking of something shiny, lustrous, and roughly a yellowy color. Maybe you're thinking of, uh, um, uh, you know, the gold's kind of malleable. Um, you know, you can bend it if it were if it were thin enough. Um, but you're, um, you're, and you're probably thinking of a, a solid thing that has a certain feel to it. You know, it's it's cold when it's buried underground. All of those ideas are what sort of jump to our mind when we hear the word um, gold. Now. 
nominal essences aren't just any old associations. He thinks they're the ones that are sort of like the, the core associations, uh, you know, the, the, the ones that we always associate and that everybody associates with gold. So probably a nominal essence there would be the, you know, the shininess of gold. That's the, the thing that we, uh, that most people always associate with, uh, with gold, or maybe an image of jewelry being made of gold would always, would be associated with the word gold. Now, real essences, on the other hand, are the, um, they're the properties that the objects actually have. Um, and he thinks they're unobservable causes of the impressions uh, that we have of objects. Now, uh, Locke's an empiricist, so he thinks that all we have, ac we, we never have access to objects in themselves. All we experience, or the only, all we have to go by is our experience. So all we're, all we're acquainted with are sensory impressions. So the real essences, they belong to the objects. And they're the properties that the objects have that cause our impressions. But because all we can observe is our impressions and we can never see the objects, Locke thought, well, we're never going to know real essences. Um, all we're going to know are uh, nominal essences. Because like Hume, he thought the ideas that we had were sort of faint copies of the impressions. Um, so what nominal essences then wind up being the reason we think of the gold color when we hear the word gold is because we see that, we get that impression whenever we see gold and we associate it all the time. And, um, and that's why that association is, is particularly, particularly strong. Now, um, the, the reason we distinguish nominal and real essences is because it, it gets us worrying uh, or it gets us thinking uh, about the nature of the kinds of things we're grouping together. Uh, what, it gets us worrying about whether or not uh, the, a collection of things that we, that we lump together really have any similarity or whether we just sort of think they have a similarity. Now take fool's gold, for example. That's the, one of the classic examples people use. Fool's gold has, has, uh, has the same sort of color that gold does and it shares a lot of the properties that regular gold has and to, you know, to most people it might even be indistinguishable, but uh, fool's gold is not real gold. Right? It doesn't have the uh, same atomic number that gold has. It's not made of the same stuff. And so if all we're doing is sort of, uh, you know, if, if, if all we're doing is looking at stuff and, and grouping it together based upon the surface level appearances of the things, we might be grouping things together that are not really the same at all. And so this, this got people worrying about, okay, well, how do we make sure the things that we're grouping together really belong together, that they're really the same kind of thing, and we don't just think that they're the same kind of thing. Now, um, uh, later on in the 20th century, two philosophers were particularly important for, for developing kind essentialism. They were uh, Hilary Putnam and Saul Kripke. Now, they're, they're not, they, they're, they've sort of uh, given up on Locke's idea, or they're inspired or thinking about Locke's idea about nominal and real essences, but they're not quite so skeptical that we can't know anything about the about, that we can't be acquainted with objects themselves. They think, you know, science is going to help us get on to the, the microstructure that, of, 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 of things that, that Locke thought was inaccessible to us. Now, um, and so what they, but they were, you know, nonetheless worried about the question that Locke's thinking raised, that he was thinking, well, you know, why do we, they, they were thinking, well, you know, what makes gold gold? Why, how do we distinguish from, um, from, from gold? And, you know, how do we make sure that we're, we're not including fool's gold and gold under one concept in the same kind, gold? Um, how do we make sure that we only have real gold? Um, how do we pick out, remember that kind essentialism is about which properties something has to have for membership in a certain kind of type. So the, now gold is a type. Um, the, the look of gold is not going to be enough. Gold, uh, fool's gold still looks shiny, so it can't be the shiny look of, look of gold that's, that is the, is, is the condition for membership to that class. So, so, so what is it really they get, they get wondering about? Now, like I said, kind essentialism has to do with what property a creature needs to have uh, to be the kind of creature it is. So we might, an example of this would be what property does a creature need to be a tiger? Right. What are the, the, the properties for membership to the class of tigers? Uh, and Kripke and Putnam came up with a specific kind of, of concept, and that was natural kinds. And they think that um, 
uh, a natural kind is distinguished from, you know, a sort of uh, the, the order of ideas that I was just talking about. A natural kind is a distinction that really exists out there in nature. It's a property that exists in nature um, that makes things actual, uh, you know, that, that, that makes things real members, a real distinction between members of that class and other classes. So their idea is, look, there's a real difference out in nature between gold and fool's gold. And it's not just our ideas or our impressions about gold and fool's gold that's going to uh, decide what belongs uh, as a member of the class gold. Rather, it's going to be some facts out there in nature that uh, drive a wedge between goals, gold and fool's gold. And so their idea was what we've got to do is we've got to look at the microstructural properties that explain the surface level properties. So in the case of gold, for example, what explains uh, why gold is shiny and you know relatively malleable? What explains all the other observable properties that it has? And they think, well, all those properties can be traced back to gold's atomic number. So what makes something gold is having the atomic number of gold. It's, the number's escaping me at the moment. Um, and fool's gold is not gold because it doesn't have that atomic number. Now, what natural kinds are supposed to, uh, what, what this sort of thinking is supposed to do is capture what kind of properties a concept tracks. So the concept gold um, uh, is, is really tracking the atomic number, right? All the, the reason that we include shiny things under the concept gold is because in real gold, the atomic number makes it shiny. We got tricked into including fool's gold because it just so happened to be shiny, but it didn't have the, the, the property that the concept gold was really tracking um, and that we were really onto when we, when we picked out things as, as gold. Uh, now, Putnam has a, a really, really famous thought experiment that's supposed to uh, help us, uh, um, you know, think through this idea, and, and it suggests for a procedure for understanding what uh, kind or property a specific concept is tracking. He imagines uh, two types of water. So there's water on Earth, and we recognize water by, you know, the fact that it's clear, that it's good for drinking, that it's a liquid, all of those surface level properties. Now imagine that you went to another planet, Twin Earth, uh, and there was a substance there that looked exactly like water, it was good for drinking, it was a liquid, um, etc. So it has all the same observable properties. But instead of being H2O, that water was made, uh, or tw twin earth water, or what we we're calling water, really had the microstructural property of being XYZ. Now what do you think? Would, would, would it still be water? And Putnam thinks, well, no, it wouldn't be water. We just, we just think it's water because it looks like it. And um, he thinks that what this suggests is the reason we say that twin earth water is not water and earth water is, is because what the concept of water was really aiming at all along was H2O. And the reason that it's convenient for us to use the fact that it's clear and drinkable uh, to recognize water is that being H2O is what explains why or causes all of those other properties. When XYZ is causing all of those other properties, um, we, you know, this, we, we, we get tricked into thinking that the surface level properties are what we really meant uh, by water. So we're making a mistake when we call twin earth water water because it's X, Y, Z. And now what Putnam thinks is we can use a sort of similar experiment to figure out uh, uh, exactly which properties are essential, right? Take, uh, and, and we can use this sort of thought experiment to figure out what a concept tracks. Is it the surface level appearance, appearances that the concept track, or is it the microstructural properties that the, that the concept tracks? We'll talk more about that idea in class. Now there's a second question the, that essences can answer that we, we might not be looking for which properties make something a certain type of thing, but we can ask what makes a particular individual the very individual that it is. So for example, we could ask what makes this chair, excuse me, a little typo, an individual that is distinct from every other chair. Now in the case of the chair, what makes that chair uh, distinct from other chairs is that it's made of, of uh, of the matter that it's made of and it has a distinct spatial location. So in this case, what we're after when we're looking for an essence is a property that makes you the unique individual that you are. If we wanted to know what, what makes you the very individual that you are, we'd want to pick out some property that you have that no one else has 
and that distinguishes you from all of them and thereby makes you an, an individual. Okay, so Saul Kripke has a, a famous way, this is sort of a, uh, one of the questions that he raises. He wants to know about the identity conditions of individual things, and he has a, an origin theory about essentialism. He thinks when we're thinking about individual essentialism, one of the big things that distinguishes us from um, other similar things or other members of, of the kind that we belong to is our history. Right? What makes me different and unique uh, uh, different from every human in a unique individual is that I have a certain sort of, you know, personal history. I've taken a path through time and space and ultimately that traces back to my origin. So in one of Kripke's work, he claims what makes the Queen of England the Queen of England? And he says that the answer is the sperm and the egg uh, that initially was the cause of the matter that made her up. So according to Kripke, our essences, as insofar as we're biological things at least, is that each of us was made up uh, and caused by a different sperm and egg. Uh, and it's the fact that we all come from different matter that makes us different individuals and distinct from every other, other individual. Okay, now I briefly want to mention a third kind of uh, essentialism that we'll talk about uh, later that comes from Charlotte Witt, and that is unessentialism. And her, uh, the idea behind unessentialism is that something's essence is what puts all of its parts together in a whole. Uh, so we might ask, for example, what makes the building materials that a house is made of into a new individual of a house? So think of a, a bunch of wood and, every, and concrete just sitting in a pile. That's not a house. All the matter that the house is made of uh, is there, but it's not a house yet. So what makes that stack of matter into a house, what produces a new individual out of that collection of stuff, uh, is the fact that we put it together in the right kind of way. So it's the function, in, in the case of artifacts, it's going to be the function that makes a new individual emerge out of a random bunch of stuff. That's what we mean by an aggregate. An aggregate is just, you know, you kind of pile a bunch of stuff together. Uh, and a pile of stuff doesn't make it a whole. You've got to put it in the right way to make it a genuine whole and to make a new individual emerge. So we can ask about the essence of a house. What makes a house a house? And in that case, we want to know what put all the parts together in the right kind of way. So that gives us three different questions that we can ask. First, we can ask, what properties does something have to have to be a member of a kind? So I'm a human being. What properties must I have in order to belong to the class of things human beings? Second, we can ask what makes this individual the very individual that it is. Um, and in order to answer that question, we, we would look for some property that distinguishes us from every other individual, something that makes us unique. Finally, we might ask what turns um, an aggregate of stuff, what makes it into a new individual, what brings the house into being out of the big pile of wood. Okay, now we're going to start here next time. Who cares about essences? And there's two types of, of, uh, of, of concerns. Scientific questions about natural kinds, right? How do we know that the concepts we're using aren't fictions we've created? How do we know when they track something real out in the world, like water? That's what the Twin Earth uh, example is supposed to show us. And then there's also political and ethical questions. Uh, and we'll begin with these. I, I, I put these up to get you thinking about them. And we'll start off um, talking a little bit about that in class. One final thing I want to conclude with, everything I've said here is, tr is built off of uh, three, uh, three works that um, and built, built off the thinking of Charlotte Witt in her book, uh, Gen The Metaphysics of Gender, on Saul Kripke's book, uh, Identity and Necessity, and on an article um, by Putnam on semantic externalism, and I'll give you the references for those in class.